Let's move on to his nephew, inshallah ta'ala, and let's talk about him. Because you have to see it all as one with the Nahi ta'ala. After Urwa bin Mas'ud is killed, his children and his widow go to Medina. And his son, particularly Abu Mulayh, Abu Mulayh says to his people, he says that I will never live with you again after what you did to my father. Like, you know, my father said not to kill in his name, but I'll never live with you. I can't be with you after what you did to my father. So they make their way to Medina and all of his children are going to end up dying in Medina pretty much as all of, all of them die, pretty much dying in Medina, if not all of them, but they will all die as Muslims. Abu Mulayh, Asim, uh, Dawood, Humam, Abu Murrah, all of these different children that he had, and he had uh, a large set of children. He also had a brother that embraced Islam, whose name was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud al thaqafi not the famous Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, uh, and who's buried in Al-Baqir. And they make their way to Al-Madinah. So the children now make their way to Al-Madinah. The chief of Ta'if tried to call his people to Islam, and he has been killed, or the Thaqafi chief has been killed. Um, so you switch over now to al Madinah al Munawwara. His widow, Maymuna bint Abi Sufyan, will be married by Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba. And we're going to talk about Al Mughira ibn Shu'ba. Uh, it just so happens that his granddaughter, Humam, his son had a daughter, that is the mother of Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi a very famous, complicated person in Islam, right? Who was a tyrant, but who also has many historical things that are attributed to him. So that's from his lineage, right? So his lineage kind of shifts over to al Madina, and his mother, uh, I'm sorry, his wife, the widow, marries al mughira ibn Shu'ba uh, al thaqafi Now let's talk about al mughira ibn Shu'ba, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Because he has a whole story. Everyone has a story here and how they come in, which is very interesting. Al Mughir ibn Shu'ba is the only Sahabi from Thaqif, the only companion from Thaqif that exists in Medina. No one else in Medina is from Thaqif. So it's basically him and Urwa who came for that short time, and that's it. Al Mughir ibn Shu'ba, the Prophet, وسلم, he said, Kanani Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi Abi Isa. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nicknamed me Abu Isa. And he is from those people that are known as Duhatul Arab. Uh, Duhatul Arab are the most intelligent and most cunning of the Arabs. He was known for his intelligence. He was known for his trickery. And he really wasn't a very good man before Islam. So he employed his trickery in all of the worst ways. Now, by the way, this is the bodyguard of the Prophet Sallallahu right? So to give you the image, he walked in like a guy that's walking around the Prophet Sallallahu that basically assigns himself as a bodyguard. He has a rough past. And he's described as Duhatul Arab. He was tall, extremely tall, huge muscles, uh, very wide shoulders, huge legs. His hair was, was plentiful and he had them tied in four braids. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Extremely strong man. Right? And he's basically going to assign himself as the bodyguard of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Like... Mughira does security, all right? Mughira does security. So anyone that's like a bodyguard can like look to Mughira and you can find like some, uh, you can find something from him, right? In terms of how he is. But his story before Islam is actually not a very nice one at all, right? And of course, Islam does away with things before and it shows you the redemptive power uh, of Islam. Basically, he left Ta'if and he said that I went out with 13 men from Banu Malik. Happened to be the tribe that shot Urwa with the arrows. The sub-tribe that shot Urwa with the arrows. So he said, I went with 13 of them to Muqawqis, the, the, the ruler of Egypt. The Coptic in Egypt. Because Muqawqis was known to be generous. So basically if Muqawqis saw people that came to him, Muqawqis would always give you something. He'd send you out. He'd invite you into his palaces. So I went out with them basically to go to Egypt to meet Muqawqis. And someone from that group had a relationship with Muqawqis. All right? And he said, I was the only one that wasn't from their group. Right? قَالَ فَاسْتَشَرْتُ عَمِّي عُرْوَةَ بْنِ مَسْعُودِ Now the story of Hudaybiyah is going to start making sense to you. He said, I asked Urwa ibn Mas'ud, my uncle, 
for advice. Fanahani, he told me, don't do it. Laysa ma'aka min bani abika ahad. No one from your, your father's people is with you, right? Like at the end of the day, yeah, you're all kind of friends and you're from Ta'af, but you're not super close. If anyone gets left out of this, it's going to be you. So it's dangerous for you to go. But he said, you know, basically, um, I decided to go anyway. All right, everything I'm about to say, remember, he wasn't Muslim at the time. <laughs> so everything he does is not Muslim at all at the time. So he said, so we entered in eventually, we tried to get in Muqawqis's face, we tried to visit him in his palace, we weren't allowed by his guards, but Muqawqis came to know about us. He met us in one of the churches uh, at the time, um, and he basically received us, a group of 14 of us, and the one that he knew from amongst us, that was kind of the leader amongst us, he brought him, he sat him next to him, and he said, "Akullukum min bani Malik, are all of you from Banu Malik? So the man said, all of us except for one. فَعَرَّفَهُ بِي فَكُنْتُ أَهْوَنَ الْقَوْمِ عَلَيْهِ وَالسُرَّ بِهَدَايَهُمْ وَأَعْطَاهُمْ الْجَوَائِزْ وَأَعْطَانِي شَيْئًا لَا يُذْكِرْ He said that basically, you know, they were given so much and they basically excluded me from everything. So they took all the stuff from him and he gave them all sorts of stuff. And then he left me out. He said, look, I'm not Muslim at the time. I was angry. I was upset. So, and he's smart. He said, I realized that it would not be a wise idea on the way back for me to try to attack all 13 of them and take their stuff. But he said, I came up with something else. Don't try this. He said, I basically got a bunch of wine and I offered them something to drink. And I told them, I have a headache, so I'm going to serve you guys. I don't want to drink. And he said, I basically got them all drunk. So I got some really good wine on the way in Egypt. Put it, poured it for them over and over and over again until they got so drunk they didn't know where they were. And then he said, basically, I eliminated them and I took all their stuff. That's Mughira before Islam. <laughs> Islam does away with everything before it. <laughs> so when you see someone that comes out of prison or you hear a story of a man that killed 99 people, Mughira has a rough past. He didn't believe in Akhirah, he didn't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, I took all their stuff, I tied their camels, and I left them behind. And he said, basically, I was like, I'm just going to live the rest of my life now, trading with all of this stuff. I don't need to go back to Ta'if. I'm good, I'm set with the money that I have. Until Islam reached him. And he wants to become Muslim. Look at the story, subhanAllah. So he goes to Medina with all of the stuff. After it's all done. It's been some time, he goes to Medina. And he enters into Medina. And I'm telling you, man, like the people of Ta'if. You get it, like these people that hurt the Prophet ﷺ, they've all got some character. The Prophet ﷺ is sitting there and Abu Bakr is with him and he sees uh, Mughira coming, this big man with all of these camels and all of the stuff and clearly well to do and even though it's been some time since that action happened like at this point now people know what happened so Abu Bakr says I'm in Misra Aqbaltum did you come from Egypt? Qultu <laughs> na'am like basically to say that I know I know what you did so he said yeah I came from Egypt qala ma fa'ala al-malikiyun what happened to the people from Banu Malik so it's kind of awkward now because he has to say that, I mean, I got rid of them basically and I took their stuff, I stole their stuff. But he said, I wasn't Muslim at the time. This is basically the way that we were in Jahiliya, right? I mean, that was the life. That's Jahiliya life. <laughs> you don't believe in Akhirah, you try to cheat each other, you try to exploit each other, you take people's stuff. They messed me over, so I'm taking them over, you know, I took their stuff. And he said, but he said, I don't want it anymore because I want to become Muslim. So he said, I want to give it all to the Prophet ﷺ and he can basically use it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to clean my hands. I want to be forgiven. And that's a testimony to his sincerity with the Prophet ﷺ. He's like, take all of the stuff. And the Prophet ﷺ responds. And he says, إِمَّا إِسْلَامُكَ He says, إِمَّا إِسْلَامُكَ As for your Islam, فَنَقْبَلُهُ We can accept your Islam. But he says, وَلَا آخِذُ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ شَيْئًا لِأَنَّ هَذَا غَدْرٍ so that money is 
treachery, stolen money. I don't want anything to do with it. So the Prophet said, I, said, I can accept your Islam. I can't accept that stuff. Right? You've got to find something else to do with that stuff. And now, Mughira says, I was so worried. I said, Ya Rasulullah, like, am I forgiven? And the Prophet like, assured him that everything that happened before Islam, you can be forgiven. But you've got to find a way to <laughs> dispose of all of that. There's a whole process of you know, undoing the harm that you did and different people and all of that, which is kind of assumed in the seerah with these texts, right? That, you know, sending things back to the tribe or something, but your Islam is accepted. You can be forgiven, but that stuff in the past, I'm not taking money that you stole from people uh, in that process. So basically, he accepted Islam. He stayed in Medina. He's the only ta'ifi, Thaqafi, that's living in Medina with the Prophet ﷺ, now come back to Hudaybiyah, he's standing next to the Prophet ﷺ, armored up, right? Because he says uh, that the Prophet ﷺ went out, وَكُنْتُ أَكُونُ مَعَ الصديق. He said that I used to be as close to the Prophet ﷺ as Abu Bakr anhu. I basically took it upon myself to be by his side all the time. I wanted to protect the Prophet ﷺ at all costs. And he's smart. He's that guy that knows how to analyze a place, that knows how to read a situation. And he's with the Prophet ﷺ. He says, فَكُنْتُ أَرْزَمُهُ I was always with the Prophet ﷺ. And then, I saw my uncle approach the Prophet ﷺ in Hudaybiyah. <laughs> And my uncle tried to put his hand on the Prophet ﷺ's beard and I hit the hand of my uncle and I told him, if you want your hand back, I suggest you don't put it on the beard of the Prophet ﷺ again. And he said, that's when my uncle said to me, Wallahi ma ghasaltu anni uh, sawataka illa bil ams. That I'm still paying off, still cleaning myself from your mess. Because what happened back in Ta'if when he did that was that Urwa ibn Mas'ud was the closest relative to Mughira. So Urwa had to pay all of the blood money and the compensation and basically try to make peace with Banu Malik because his nephew was the one that did what he did. So Urwa was like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm cleaning up your mess in Ta'if. I just finished last night finally dealing with, I mean obviously it's, it's a figure of speech, but I just finished cleaning up your mess in Ta'if. And now here I am in Hudaybiyah, and you're the one knocking my hand and standing next to the Prophet I'm like talk about a moment where it all comes back uh, in my face. He's like, I'm different now. And of course, he is from the uh, companions of Bay'atul Ridwan, from the companions of those who took the pledge with the Prophet I'm under the tree, and who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that he was pleased with. So his Islam is sincere, his repentance is sincere, but what a past. <laughs> Urwa has a past, he's got a past, right? And these are the only two like Muslims of Ta'if that we know at this point that are with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fast forward. So how does it all come full circle now with the two of these figures involved? The Prophet Sallallahu placed Ta'if under siege and he left them. And he made dua that Thaqif would come back to him as Muslims, that Allah would eventually guide them. Urwa comes back to his people and they killed Urwa ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he called them to Islam. That was after the siege of Ta'if. They thought to themselves, uh-oh, we just killed Urwa ibn Mas'ud and now he's with the Prophet sallallahu He's aligned with the Prophet sallallahu Let's hurry up and send a delegation to Medina so that we can basically come to peace with the Prophet sallallahu We don't want like what we did to Urwa to cause a war between us and the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. So they send, subhanAllah, so Urwa actually achieves what he wanted. This is minal mu'mineen rijal on sadaqu, the truthfulness of intention. They only went to Medina because they were afraid of the repercussions of killing him. So they sent 13 men to Medina as a delegation to the Prophet ﷺ to basically make peace with the Prophet ﷺ. So 13 if he's come to Medina to meet the Prophet ﷺ in Medina with everything that they did. Imagine if you were the Prophet ﷺ. You people stoned me, spit on me, almost killed me, put me through the worst of the worst. And now you're coming into my city and everybody here would understand. And you killed my emissary. You killed Urwa. 
your own chief who I sent back to you as a Muslim. Imagine if you're the Prophet Now it's time for revenge, right? It's payback time for all that you did. No. The Prophet is about to enter into Ramadan and he hears about the delegation that's coming. Mughira comes to the Prophet and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Abna'u umumati, uridu an ukrimahum. He said, Ya Rasulullah, these are my cousins. Let me, let me be the one to honor them. Can I have the honor of receiving them? And this after, obviously, what he did to them. And so part of what's implied in that, I kind of did something really bad to them before. Maybe this is a way that I can also, because they're from Banu Malik, I can also kind of make peace with them. Let me be the one to receive them in Medina, kind of win back the hearts, come back to that agreement with them, sort of bring back the tribe. The Prophet said, okay, but with a condition. He said, what's the condition? The Prophet said, pitch a tent for them right in the corner of the masjid. Why? They can hear us reading the Quran, they can watch us pray, so that their hearts can soften. SubhanAllah. Da'wah. Da'wah. I'm not interested in revenge. Let them just see us in our element. Can you imagine Ramadan with the Prophet ﷺ in Medina? Just let them watch us in Ramadan. At this point now, the community's developed, right? People from all over the world in Medina. Let them come, set them up right next to the masjid so that they can hear the Quran and so that they can watch us pray. The story still takes many twists and turns. If you were to read in Sunan Abi Dawood, ma ja'a fi khabar al-ta'if, uh, what has been narrated about ta'if, you can see about how weird the conversation becomes with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Banu Thaqif. I mean, you've got some nerve with everything you did to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to come here with any expectations, right? With any type of, of demands. To come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and after they've kind of seen it and Islam is starting to enter into their heart, they say, all right, listen, we'll become Muslim, but we have all these conditions. What are your conditions? They said, zina, we're not giving that up. Adultery, fornication, sorry. <laughs> Prophet ﷺ said, what's haram is haram. I can't make haram, halal. I can't tell you no, you can continue to commit adultery and just be Muslim as a condition of your Islam. And he said, no noble people will continue to do this. Like, it's not noble. And subhanAllah, there are so many different uh, conversations that happen here. There is one man who came and he had 10 wives. 10 wives. So he said, I'm keeping all 10 of them. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, you're not. <laughs> he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, amsik minhunna arba'a wa fariq sa'irahunna. Islam limited this you have to divorce six. So, all right, we don't like this, but we'll keep talking. Riba, usury, interest, we want to keep doing it. We trade in riba, that's how we make our money. Now you can imagine, like the Prophet ﷺ could say, Mughira, can you just finish the rest of these off the way you did back in Egypt? I'm kind of tired of you guys, go back, get out of here. Like, you're, you're crazy to think this. But they said, riba, uh, we still want to deal in riba. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَكُمْ رُؤُوسَ أَمْوَارِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ Look, you have the profit of what you earn. You don't wrong and you, you don't be wronged. Right? Riba is not halal. Riba is not going to be halal for you in any situation. Okay? So we have that. Shout out to a continuous charity sponsorship. Uh, look them up. No riba. Okay? So no zina, no riba. They're like, all right, this is really... Like, all right. They say to the Prophet ﷺ, we're not going to fight with you. No jihad. No zakah. We're not going to spend money. So no battles. We don't want to get involved in any battles. And no zakah. No sadaqah. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ is listening to them. And the Prophet ﷺ says, okay. Umar radiallahu ta'ala was like, wait a minute. <laughs> These are hypocrites. We're going to take them out. The Prophet ﷺ says, listen. I know how these people are. Once they become Muslim, they're going to fight alongside us and they're going to give their zakah. They're going to give their sadaqah. 
Like, don't worry, Umar, I know what I'm doing here. Right? They said, five times a day salah, we don't want to pray. <laughs> what do you want? We, we'll, we'll say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, like we'll ally ourselves to you, but no prayer, no sadaqah, no fasting, no, no, no fighting. Uh, we still do zina, we still do riba. Like, what kind of Islam is this? The Prophet ﷺ says, listen, as if I was so beautiful. He says, لا خير في دين ليس فيه ركوع. What good is there in a religion with no prayer? What good is there in a religion with no prayer? They said, all right, well, negotiate with us. We don't like five prayers. Can we do two, two times a day? Prophet ﷺ says, you know what? Fine, pray twice a day. Umar is like... <laughs> You're rocking my world here. This is not what we're used to, right? We're used to when someone says you're becoming Muslim, it's five times a day out the gate. What are you doing? Just pray in the morning and the evening. The Prophet says, Sophia Salun, they're going to pray, Umar. Just let them get over this hump. I know what they're doing. They're, they're from Thaqif, they're tough. We've dealt with them enough, right? Then at the end, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, he says, they said, all right, what's the last thing? He said, your idol, Allah, has to go. You can't worship an idol anymore. You would think that's the most common sense part of this, is get rid of your idol. They said, absolutely not. They said, if we try to get rid of the idol, the idol's going to destroy us. Halakna. We try to hurt that idol, and Allah was, by the way, a huge idol built of stones. We try to hurt Allah, Allah is going to destroy us. Umar radiallahu anhu couldn't like hold himself. Umar radiallahu anhu says, وَيْحَكَ ya Kinana. Kinana was the one speaking on behalf of him. أَرَجُلٌ أَحْمَقَ أَنْتِ Literally, are you stupid? Are you really that thick-headed? What is wrong with you? He says, أَتَخَافُونَ مِنْ حِجَارَةِ You're afraid of stone? You're afraid of these rocks? You built that idol. You think that idol is going to be able to hurt you? And Kinana responds to him. He says, لَمْ نَأْتِكَ يَا ابْنِ الْخَطَّابِ We didn't come to you, o Ibn al-Khattab. We're talking to Muhammad Wasallam. Leave us alone. Let us negotiate here with the Prophet The Prophet is showing patience with them. He says, Yuhdam, the idol has to go. They said, Ya Rasulullah, everything but that. He said, Yuhdam, the idol has to go. Like, I can't negotiate with you on idol worship here. They said, fine, look at how thick-headed they are. They said, Arsul man yahdimuha min indik. Send someone else to destroy it, because we're not going to destroy it with our own hands, because Allah is probably going to hurt someone if you try to destroy it. Like, it's still in them. It's the ignorance is still in them. Prophet says, fine. Mughira, go with them. <laughs> so Mughira ibn Shu'bah, after killing 13 of them in Jahiliyyah, never gone back as a fugitive, Mughira's like, oh, I'd love this. I'm going to go back with them to destroy Allah. Go back with them to destroy the idol. So Mughira goes, Khalid radiallahu anhu says, I'm coming with you. Because they don't trust, obviously, the way this can go. I mean, this could easily turn into like, all right, you remember what you did back in the day? Take them out on the way, right? Mughira goes with them. And they get to a ta'if. And Mughira starts to climb up a lot. When I say this guy is a character, this man is a character. Subhanallah. So as Murghira is climbing up a lot because it's a huge stone, he puts his hand up and then he goes, <gasps> and then they all go, <gasps> and they're like, oh, his hand is paralyzed. And Murghira goes, ah, my back. They're like, a lot, a lot, a lot. And then Murghira goes, basically, you silly people. <laughs> And he said, I told you this thing can't do anything to you. And he starts beating down a lot and he destroys it. Just to show them how silly their idol worship was and how uh, everything that they thought about a lot uh, was not real. And so in that, subhanAllah, you have the rest of them. So now you have Urwa, you have al Mughira, you have the children, and they all are now Muslims. And Ta'if finally starts to taste the sweetness of al Islam as a thaqif enters into al-Islam. I want to give you just, in, in conclusion here, inshallah ta'ala, a few things about al-Mughira ibn Shu'bah. Your character doesn't, you know, there's something about you. Your character is refined in Islam. But al-Mughira was a smart man. And his whole life, subhanAllah, the man was brilliant. He literally stuck to the Prophet ﷺ, set himself up as the bodyguard of the Prophet ﷺ, standing in front of the door of the Prophet ﷺ, moving with the Prophet ﷺ. And you find, subhanAllah, he narrates 
so many ahadith about the wudu of the Prophet Sallallahu about the travel habits of the Prophet Sallallahu about all of these different things with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu passes away, I want to leave his story with the death of the Prophet Sallallahu to the end. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu put him in charge of Al-Bahrain and he was the governor of Bahrain for some time. He put him in charge of Kufa and he put him in charge of Basra. So Umar radiallahu anhu used him as a governor three times. I mean, he's a very capable man. And Bahrain, some of the people didn't like him because they felt him to be a little bit too tough. And Umar liked him because he was tough. All right? So they plotted against him. And there was a group of men. They said, Umar hates people who bribe, right? So look at the plot that they came up with. They said that this group of businessmen, they said that we're going to give 100,000 to one of us. And that person go to Umar radiallahu anhu and say, hey, Mughira took this from Baytul Mal, from the treasury, and he bribed us with this. And we wanted to bring it back to you out of nobility. So they came to Umar radiallahu anhu in Medina, said, we got 100,000 dirhams. Mughira bribed us in Bahrain. And we want to kind of turn him in and give this back to you. So Umar radiallahu anhu calls in Mughira. Mughira walks in. He says, what's going on? Umar radiallahu anhu says, these people are saying you bribed them with 100,000 from Baytul Mal. He said, yeah, where's the other 100,000? So what are you talking about? He said, I gave you 200. And he starts like frightening the man. And the man basically breaks under pressure and tells the whole story. <laughs> that he lied about the whole thing. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, why did you do that? And he said, because I wanted them to know that lying never benefits them. So I wanted to sort of put them back in their place. Right, that, that, that that's not going to work. So Umar radiallahu anhu put him in charge of many different uh, cities. He sent him as an emissary to many different leaders. He was the messenger from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu to Rustum before the battle of Qadisiyah, the leader of Persia. Um, he lost an eye in the battle of Yarmouk under Khalid and Walid radiallahu anhu. So he was someone who was fierce in the battlefield. He was one of those, subhanAllah, who when the fitna happened in the Sahaba, he completely left the fitna. He didn't want to take any side. So he left everything, sort of public life, for years until that all blew over. And then he went on to once again become the governor of Kufa during the time of Muawiyah. And uh, he would pass away in Kufa 50 years after Hijrah. Now, subhanAllah, he said he was just so smart. And so he just had this intelligence and this street smart to him. And that's sort of, again, that type of person you want around you to sort of read people's body language, read behavior, that bodyguard of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they said he used to, you know, he used to be so cunning. And he said there was only one man that ever tricked him. One man that ever tricked him. And that was that Mughira wanted to marry someone. And as he was about to marry this woman, uh, he asked this man, he said, you know, what do you think? Should I marry her? And the man responded and he said, she's no good, I saw her kiss a man. So Mughira said, oh, okay. So he moved on. Then the next day he saw her married to him. So Mughira said, what happened? He said, I saw her kiss her father. <laughs> so Mughira says, you're the only person in my life who ever outsmarted me. Right, you tricked me. Um, but he passed away, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, in Al-Kufa. And um, subhanAllah, there's so much about him. Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Sahibtu al-Mughira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, falaw anna madinata laha thamaniyatu abwab la yukhraju min babin minha illa bi makr la kharaja min abwabiha kulliha. He said that I was with al-Mughira. He said if Medina had eight doors and no one could escape except through, you know, plotting and using some sort of scheme, he said I would trust that Mughira would get out of all eight of them. That's how smart he was radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And when he passed away, subhanAllah, he had several kids. The best of his kids was Urwa ibn al-Mughira. So he named one of his children after his uncle, Urwa ibn Mas'ud. And his son, Urwa ibn al-Mughira, became a governor and a scholar as well. The last thing I'll mention here in his trickery was the most beautiful trick that he ever played. Mughira was the bodyguard of the Prophet Sallallahu He loved to always watch the Prophet Sallallahu back. So he said that when the Prophet ﷺ died, he was kind of in this dilemma because the family of the Prophet ﷺ was around him. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Al-Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Basically, Banu Hashim had taken the duties of washing the body of the Prophet ﷺ and caring for him. And I was used to always being next to the Prophet ﷺ. Look at this love. He said, but I didn't want to violate the space of the family. So for the first time in the Prophet Sallallahu life, and he as a Muslim, he has to stand back. The washing is happening, 
He's used to standing in front of the door of the Prophet I can't stand guard there anymore. I can't guard him with my body. And subhanAllah, in Ta'if, what was it? The Prophet didn't have anyone to guard him except for Zayd ibn Harith. And here, this Ta'ifi man is like, I wanted to be with him. So he said, here's what I did. He said, when they brought the Prophet body to his grave, he said, I accidentally dropped my ring in his grave. <laughs> Why? Because he said, I wanted to be the last person to touch the body of the Prophet so he used to say, I'm the last person to ever touch the body of the Prophet And Ali radiallahu ta'ala who knew what I was doing, but he let it go, right? Like I wanted to have that closeness to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa so he used to say, I'm the last person who ever touched the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are two men, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi, Mughira ibn Shu'ba al-Thaqafi, the two first men from a ta'if that sort of take that turn with Thaqif, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll continue later on and speak about the other dimension, which are the children and the freed slaves of Ta'if as well.